So why don't we say we'll go until 7 with this discussion, and then we'll have to go to the next agenda item. How's that sound? Okay. So, um, please go ahead. Actually, um, suspending the rules for the record so that I won't open the meeting formally. Suspend the uh, rabbit rules? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I can have people sign in just because I'm going to get everything Do you want everyone to sign in before we speak? No. 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 Yeah, I'll just talk to you. May yeah, I begin to speak? Feel free yes, to please do. <laughs> um, so I'm here to call attention to um, an incident that happened on Thursday, May 23rd, um, with the Green Mountain Transit, which is contracted by Burlington School District to transport children um, home or to wherever they're going from Edmonds Middle School and Edmonds Elementary School. The incident occurred at 3 p.m. on May 23rd on bus line number 47, bus number 914, Green Mountain Transit. The bus driver of this bus carrying Edmonds Middle School and Edmonds Elementary School students forced approximately 17 students of color to disembark because they were singing and clapping. Two of these students are my own children. I happened to be at Barrio Bakery, which is on North Kaminsky Avenue. At the time, I saw the group of students walking on North Kaminsky Avenue. I came outside to see what was going on, and the students asked me to take a video testimony. They report that the bus driver targeted students of color on the bus, threatened to call the police, and made all students of color exit the bus while white students remained seated. <coughs> These children ranged in age from approximately 13 to five years old, middle schoolers and elementary school students, a kindergartner. They report that the driver's action was unilateral, whether or not the children were making any sound. It is against Green Mountain Transit policy to eject children from the bus without first calling a supervisor. Some children refused to exit the bus because they knew their right to safe transportation. When the driver threatened to call the police, they were scared and exited the bus. Some ran. One child lost his shoes. Many of the children were far from their destination. Some did not know how to get where they were going. All were students of color. When I saw the group of children, they were sad, confused, and angry. This is clearly a safety concern. It is also a community concern, as the children were apparently targeted on the basis of skin color. It is not a crime to sing and clap while brown and black. Some of these children were enjoying each other's company and making music at the end of a long school day. Others were sitting quietly on the bus. As a mother and community member, I am outraged at what I saw. I do not want my children or any others growing up to believe that they will endanger themselves by being joyful, by singing out loud, because of the color of their skin. Thank you for addressing this complaint. And that is what I emailed to the Green Mountain Transit Authority Company. And I have also shared that with members of the school district. Um, I have. Before I take any questions, I have also a few points that I identified of my asks for this committee um, from the school board and from the district in general. Um, these are my requests. The first is to seek justice and resolution for the families who are affected, to make sure that everything is followed through according to all the proper channels and that the families are contacted and that they are aware and that they have the support that they need to process the event. My second request is to review the contract between Burlington School District and Green Mountain Transit, review the supervision of students on transportation while they're under Burlington School District supervision, and make sure that this never happens again. My third ask is to reach out to the students and families who are affected to affirm that the school community understands their experience and does not condone discrimination against children of color. And that's one where I think you mm -hmm. folks can be very helpful. Um, I know that you're working on 
uh, reparative processes, restorative practices. practices. Um, that's that's one where I think that you could really do a lot there, and I'm also asking for complete follow through on on the event with any possible means that you have to follow through with it, including contacting all of the families because it, it may be the case that all of the families do not know that this event occurred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The families of the kids that were mm -hmm. <coughs> There were many children affected. Mm -hmm. I, I knew some, so the, the children asked me to take a video testimony, um, which I have shared only with concerned family members and, and with the school. Uh, I'm not sharing that with media or um, on social media because I think it's very important to protect the children's identities in the event that there were any retaliations. Um, so, the purpose of taking that video was really to just get their testimony, which I've written up here as best as I could, um, and to speak for them, because that's my job as an adult, um, uh, as a caring adult, is to represent their voices when, when, they're, when they need to be protected. Thank you. Who would, does anyone else want to speak at this time? Yeah, I, I think I do. <coughs> um, so I, you just say your name my name is Erin, Erin Stark Hughes. Um, I want to say that while this incident was really uh, gut-wrenching as a parent, especially if you're a young child, I want everyone to know and to go out there and do their own research that this is a drop in the bucket of the grievances that have happened with these bus drivers and with these children. I know of a young woman who's raised in this community. She's a woman of color. She's a sophomore in college. Her first experience with racism was at the age of eight years old by the hands of a bus driver in the city of Burlington. I have heard white students repeat the things that they've heard bus drivers say about, about black and brown children when the black and brown children aren't there. I have uh, had other fellow parents not know where their children were because the bus driver chose to call the police and have the bus pulled over on the side of the road for an hour and a half because somebody threw an empty plastic water bottle. The things that happen on these buses are, it's like, this is going on and on and on and on. And the Burlington Police Department is aware, and there's the very distinct feeling that they don't care. I had a very scathing email from Brandon Del Pozo himself basically accusing me of not having good parenting skills, when I made it very clear in the email that I addressed to him that my child was not involved in the incident, but I'm raising the incident as a concerned community member. I do not feel like it's a good use of my taxpayer dollars to see three cruisers and four uniformed officers involved for a school bus where a plastic water bottle was thrown. It makes me angry as a community member and it makes me upset as a parent. Um, so I think that this is like the push that we need, but Green Mountain, I've spoken with Jamie Smith at Green Mountain. His response is that the onus is half on BSD and half on him and that there's gonna be some meetings and we're gonna have some talks and we're gonna see where we can go. And my answer to him was I was like, way too little and way too late. Do you know what day and age we're facing right now? With what's going on nationally, the sensitivities are so heightened, it's becoming a very hard line. You're on one side or the other. There is no more gray area in these issues. And as a Burlington community member, it's really important to me that this community stands on the right side of history. And these are the times and this is the moment to start making those changes and making those voices heard and really letting it known where there is no tolerance. And so this is something that has been going on for a really long time. And like for me now, I've got this like burning thing in me, like this is one area where we're gonna see this stop. And I think GMT needs to be doing so much more. They do not have a code of conduct that drivers have to sign. They have no enforceable accountability measures for misbehavior of conduct. The only thing they've done with this driver is take him off this route. He has <coughs> not been suspended. He has not had any deduction in pay. He has not been penalized in any way. They further do not offer any implicit bias training, cross-cultural communications training, or training on how to deal with children. They take a standard CDL holder and put them in this environment and then blame the problems on the Burlington School District. I find the approach from GMT extremely problematic. And I know we don't have a lot of options here in Burlington, but if we had an option, I would say let's pull contract right away and find some, another form of transportation because their responses have been not even half a percent of what I would expect. That's what I have to say. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> would anyone else like to speak? This is not your last chance. Um, so before, I just didn't want to start um, 
sharing information until people felt if they want to be heard first. So I'm going to just share some information um, personally, and then we do have information from um, the district that we can share, which I would ask Jean and Monica to share. Um, but I just want to let you all know that I used to work for what was CCTA, and so I have some. Um, I was also I was the federal compliance manager, and for that reason, I want to give you kind of an explanatory description of the arrangement between the bus um, transit authority and the school district. So under FTA rules, because there is a very strong lobby from private busing companies, public transit authorities are not allowed to formally provide school bus transportation. So what um, the city and the transit authority do and so the way bus service works, as a transit authority, there's all these member municipalities, and I apologize if I am like sound like I'm wandering. There's these member municipalities, that's Oskanooski, South Burlington, Williston, blah, blah, blah. They all purchase hours from the bus service, okay? So um, in order to transport our kids to school, the city purchases hours, and Infinite's organization, Parents We Use for Change, arrange for this in Winooski as well. The city has to purchase hours from the transit authority when it wants to add service. And so the city purchases hours to add service in the morning and at the end of the day in order to accommodate kids coming and going to school. The district does not have a contract with the transit authority. We do not have a written agreement with the transit authority. We are not allowed to have a written agreement because it would violate FTA regulations. The city purchases <coughs> hours and pays for those hours. That's the way it works. Having said that, um, and so the fares are paid by, I think the city or the school, like the city bills the school for some fair revenue. Um, so having said that, in the past, and so um, Aaron, um, if some parents were here who have had kids in the schools for a long time, use the bus system, they would corroborate what you're saying and more around the arrangement being not only less than perfect, but um, occasionally spike, spiking into the harmful zone. Um, so uh, in the past, we have had resources put into bus monitors to ride with the kids. That happened like when things got bad enough and then we'd like pay some people to ride on the bus. It very inconsistently, very resource dependent, very much dependent on which district administrator <coughs> was dealing with the situation. Totally inconsistent. So personally, um, I think bus monitors is a good idea. And so what I will say to you is what I say to all constituents, if there's a budget need, people have to show up and advocate for it or it won't happen. The time to advocate for it is in November and December, advocate loudly, organize, don't let up, and your voice will be the loudest. That's just budget 101. Um, secondly, I would say that um, having worked at Green Mountain Transit Authority, uh, they have a union contract, and the union contract is what <coughs> governs things like code of conduct and accountability. So they also have a board, and every member of the municipality has two representatives to the board. And so I know it's tiring to go to public meetings and bring information and advocacy. There's a board meeting every month at Green Mountain Transit. And there um, is another lever to push. And you know, I think as we saw recently with the police, um, they have a union contract too. Firing people is governed by union contracts. Can I just dovetail one thing that with the irony of this that came up to me and I know it was I think it was CCTV which was doing the union drive a few years ago and the kids were really supporting the drivers in this and I think that's the saddest part about this all, all the kids were out there really supporting everybody and you know I think going to the Green Man Transit Board would be interesting to say hey you know we stick together in these kinds of things and we got to call each other out on these kind of things so yeah, I mean, I think it's important, like personally, I support unions because they advocate for high wages and benefits. So, you know, unions right, are really right. important and we should have more. However, 
unions can do more than just advocate for wages and benefits. They right. can advocate for other things like social and racial justice. Right, exactly. And it would be great if unions did that too. But they don't, at least not in locally. Sure. I want to add something um, that's not in my statement. Um, according to the children with whom I spoke, after I saw them exit the bus, uh, the bus driver threatened to call the police on them. Um, and I want to point out explicitly that that threat is received very differently from for people of color than it is for white people. Um, it scared those children very much, very much, so that even one child was running off the bus and lost his shoes. When another child found his shoes and brought them back to him, um, th like that kind of practice is racist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the district we have um, learned that, and so our relationship with the police department has changed <coughs> because of that very ex lived experience. Um, I think it would be important for Green Mountain Transit to hear that and to, you know, be pressured to have implicit bias training. Their training is governed by the FTA. Their training is paid by the FTA. And so when you want them to add training that's not required, it requires advocacy and you know other kinds of things. So um, yeah, um, I agree. And so the district doesn't have access to the drivers to train them or prevent that sort of thing. It, it's, you know, that's Green Mountain Transit and the city who are kind of the authoritative bodies in terms of paying for things and contractual arrangements and, you know, requirements. Um, so I wish the district could do something, but I do want to hand it over to Jean and Monica to share what the district is doing. And I think in terms of like notifying on the parents, you know, I would ask staff about that, but I believe we would support, I personally would support that, I personally would ask staff to do that and follow through and let us know and get back to the community. Just one correction. Uh, the transportation service that we organized for in Winooski had nothing to do with the city of Winooski or the district paying into uh, GMT. Oh, really? It, we actually organized. We there was a contract. There's a contract with the South Burlington School District, and so we use their. They use their <coughs> food and the concert. We use South Burlington buses in Winooski. Oh, so you, it's the private bus company. Oh, I thought you. Okay, then I left off at a certain point that it didn't. Really, I thought you had changed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll stop talking and. Another question so, so my name is Thomas Chittenden. I'm currently the chair of the Green Mountain Transit Board. Great. And I, Thanks for coming. All, I'm sorry. I started, thought it started at 7. I apologize for missing your opening remarks. I'd love to talk with you afterwards. I think you're going to receive them. Okay, great. My apologies, and I'll watch the tape as well. I, I just want to say I'm sorry this happened. I'm still getting up to speed on what happened and what we can do, and I just took some notes on the last few remarks you made, and I'm fully supportive of doing a full investigation of this, doing implicit tr uh, bias training, also looking at the code of conduct. These, This is paramount of... Uh, has our paramount attention right now. We're absolutely going to take this up at our June 18th Tuesday morning meeting at 7.30 a.m. You're all welcome to come to that. We also have a leadership committee meeting the week before, and I'd be happy to meet with any of you as well. But just know that this has our full attention, and we want to do better. So our full board meeting is at 7.30 a.m., but there's free coffee, okay, so, um, and that's uh, on June 18th, which is always uh, the third Tuesday of the month, of every month. And it's at Green Mountain Transit on Industrial Ave in Burlington. And there are subcommittee meetings that meet the week before. And those would be a great time to also hear from anybody that wants to be heard. Be glad to hang around and talk to anybody afterwards as well. Great, thank you. So do you want to, someone want to share the, what the district is doing to Jane and Monica? Mm -hmm. Do you want to do this? Um, so do you want to talk about what the plan is? Yeah, I mean, we asked the staff, what are you guys doing, you know, and uh, got communication back. So what I found out was that all the students on the bus were uh, from EMS and EES. Uh, the youngest student that was asked to leave the bus was five, which concerns me because where's this five-year-old going? Um, and I think uh, BSC staff and GMT met to review the video of the incident this morning. Um, 
the bus driver didn't follow numerous protocols. Um, but according, I, I don't know if it was according to the video. Um, the video shows a group of students dancing, singing, and screaming in the back third of the bus in an unsafe and distracting manner. They can be heard hitting the bus or windows. After, after yelling unsuccessfully for the students to stop hitting the windows, the driver stopped the bus, went to the back of the bus, and asked everyone in the rear of the bus to leave or he would call the police. All students in the back of the bus, inclusive of, of all races, were asked to leave the bus. All students in the front of the bus, inclusive of all races, were allowed to remain on the bus. Um, and then I guess the five-year-old appeared to be confused, but um, he was asked to leave, but then he appears that he was under the guidance of an older student. Um, GMT is apologetic and agrees this never should have happened. Um, and then going forward, the driver has been removed from the bus route, um, and this says that GMT is starting an internal investigation. It also says that Jan Marty, uh, Marty Spalding and GMT are meeting tomorrow to debrief, and that principals have been meeting with students um, to figure out ways to best process the incident. There's plans for summer conversations to answer the very thing you're asking, what should the proper process systems and procedures be. Um, and then Edmonds administrators are looking to hold special assemblies to discuss rules and expectations regarding bus safety and protocols and how to report an incident. Yeah. For the children? <coughs> how did the children report an incident? Any, anybody. That's actually been a reoccurring theme. How do people find resources? To Many of these communicate? children do not have phones. No. Mm -hmm. Most of the children who were ejected from the bus did not have phones. Right. They had no way to contact their parents. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have anyone to advocate for them at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's, you know, what the district is trying to do is um, be as proactive as possible. And um, like you showed up with the bus number. That's like a key piece of information people usually don't know. If you have a bus number, it makes all the difference because you know which bus, who is driving. Like literally, that's kind of the key. So, you know, if, if the district's going to create processes and give kids, empower kids, you know, then the district needs information about, or suggestions for how to empower the kids. So if you're saying they don't have phones, they don't talk to their parents, but they found somebody to tell, you know, then that's not really a formal process. I think the district is trying to say, how do we equip our kids with a formal process as, and their parents and families as much as we can so that someone on the bus will remember, oh yeah, we're supposed to get the bus number or whatever, you know, but there is videotape of every bus. Um, so when the incident happens, like if the, pro if the procedures fall apart, which is plausible, May I reply? Yeah. Um, that afternoon, I spent some time with a couple of the other children who were on the bus because we had a date to get ice cream. I was driving them around to their basketball practices, so I was able to overhear some of their conversation. Um, one conversation that I overheard, these were all children of color, friends of my own kids. Um, and one of the conversations that I overheard was, their friend telling them, always look for a badge number, always look for the bus number, always know like what the, find out who the name of your person is. And I, and I really do want to make this explicitly clear, mm -hmm. that is training that is handed down but in families of color mm -hmm. um, because you need to be able to represent yourself when nobody else will. Mm -hmm. So this, this is training that my children were receiving from a friend of theirs. Always look for a badge number. Always look for a bus number. You know, that's that's not something that tends to happen in white families so much. And I really want to make that clear. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's the kind of training, you know, that the school can reinforce for everybody um, and try and get the information to parents um, about, you know, what the arrangement is, what to expect, what not to expect, code of conduct on the bus. Um, all those sorts of things. Um, and this is more of a structural thing, and I'm not going to be, I'm a teacher, I'm not going to be able to come to your board meeting. Um, and I understand that <coughs> sort of like 
in terms of the rules that there's limitations for what BSD can do. Um, I think sometimes saying like our hands are tied is, I think sometimes is a way to like not uh, really advocate for like change. Um, and so I understand that like on paper BSD might not have, doesn't have a, a contract with the district. I also know that like if enough people in positions of power like y'all are actually extremely clear about needs that need to be met in the community that people often listen. Um, and something I'm noticing, and I think saying like, oh, well kids have a clear way of reporting is really important, but that's a really re reactive response. And just hearing, I think kids, um, it was, the, the notes were saying like, that they were yelling, and to me it seems like there's a real lack of trust between the kids and the drivers, and it seems like that, there's a lot of reason why that's really true. Um, and so I'm interested too about potentially what it looks to like go a step up and imagine sort of like as a community organizing project, what does it look like to do restorative justice work, to do reparative work so that like the drivers like actually maybe know the kids' names or that the kids know some things about the driver that they <coughs> actually like, we talk about like community policing, like the cops like, you know, instead of driving around their cruisers, they need to walk around the neighborhood. And it seems like there might be I'm interested in what it might look like to really do some relationship building between the bus drivers and the kids so that when the bus drivers are like, hey, that's really unsafe, could you stop? The kids feel like actually they're like respected and valued by the bus driver enough so that they have an incentive to listen. Um, I'm a teacher and my, my experience with young people is like, you don't want to listen to people you think don't give a shit about you. Um, <laughs> it seems like maybe that's happening. Um, yeah, so I'm interested in what sort of going a, a level up looks like and really kind of imagining what trust building looks like. I, I'd also like to um, make sure that when we're examining this, we're bringing into the, the sort of fold or perspective the very real and proven data and research is out there that shows that the same behavior by a white child versus that behavior by a child of color is not viewed the same by those in charge and that every time these incidences have happened, there's always this thing of, oh, well, the kids were misbehaving. And it's like, well, they're children at 3 p.m., okay? They've just gotten out of school. They're not really misbehaving. They just have all this energy. And when a white boy does it, he's just being a kid. And when a black kid does it, the cops get called. It's, it's so grossly disproportionate. And in these incidences with the drivers, all of these bad behaviors, and even the cops being like, oh, those kids aren't behaving right, those kids, every single time, excludes the white children from the equation and it only points to the children of color when the behaviors are equally as rambunctious across both, if not even more rambunctious because usually the other students are a little bit more concerned about getting in trouble because they get in trouble more often. Mm -hmm. So I, I take a lot of like sensitivity to this, uh, I'm sorry, I have a lot of sensitivity around um, this idea that the kids need to be doing something. I understand, yes, they need to respect the bus driver, they need to respect adults, but the onus is not on the children to solve this problem or to change the way in which a 13 year old feels at 3 p.m. because that's not going to change. The onus is on the adults to behave better. That's, and uh, so I just like, I, I hear this coming back to the kids a lot and that's what I've heard from a lot of other authority figures in the community and I take a lot of sort of offense to that perspective. Can I like, say something more? Um, I did see um, a video from one child, I cannot show this because it identifies the children, but I saw a video from one of the children that um, was taken before the bus driver ejected the kids, and I could see exactly what they were doing um, in the video. And they were going like this. They were clapping, and they had a little chant going that they were singing, and they were smiling, they were joyful, they were enjoying themselves. They, the, these were, they, they may not have been following exactly the bus rules at that moment, perhaps a reminder, you know, I bet, to that I can't speak, but what I can tell you for sure is that they were beautiful, playful <coughs> children. That's what I saw. Mm. So you didn't see any knocking on the windows? No, or? I didn't see that in the video, no. And no. it was like four students, and 17 of them got kicked off the bus. Oh. So that's the other issue. So four students were clapping. And or maybe five, there weren't many. Okay. In the video there was maybe four or five. 
and, and they were having a good time. 17 was how many I counted when I saw them. Many others had scattered already by the time they had got, because they got dropped off on North Street. I saw them on North Kuniski Avenue. So there were others too. And I don't know who, I don't know, I, I wasn't a witness on the bus, so I don't know who all was on the bus, who all got picked off, who all stayed seated. But I can tell you that what was going on, I am also a teacher as well as a mother, and I really try to protect um, the uh, right for children to have joy and play. And you know, if that wasn't the time, uh, that's, that's a thing. But that is not cause to eject them from the bus or to call the police. Yeah, I want to, um, I want to just, you know, everything you're saying, we can validate. Um, I think what Monica was trying to do is just read to you where the um, administration is at in terms of what their perception is of what they can do um, around what the district has control over. Um, we're not here to, you know, justify it or to say whether, you know, like, pers like as a board member, I totally want to validate everything you're saying. Um, and we'll definitely advocate for the district. You know, we can go to Tom Chittman and, you know, I know the administration is talking with G Green Mountain Transit. They've admitted this shouldn't have happened. They've admitted. I agree, pulling the bus driver off is not the solution. We all, I think, have been through this same issue in the past few months with another city department. So, you know, we are living with racial injustice and implicit bias throughout our city and our institutions and the district's no different, the bus is no different, and we all have to, you know, be able to come and tell this story over and over, which I don't know how exhausting that is for people of color, but I know how exhausting it is for me <coughs> for all of us, and it's you know exponentially magnified. So, um, just because of time, I just want to say we hear you. We will advocate. There's nothing we're, you know I can offer you other than our ability to do that and to support you. Since we, if we had a contract with the transit authority, we'd be in a completely different. It would be a completely different conversation. But the, but this district has, you know, a bill from the city that we pay, so the city can pay the transit authority for providing more service at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. All of this about like, you know, blaming kids is. It, we will def. I will personally like. I think the staff would never blame the kids for you know, what happened today. That is just not, um, you know, an option or real. So um, it is all about training and, you know, making the path to shine the light on, on how, you know, inequitable, unjust this kind of situation is. And so I don't want anybody to feel like we're just passing this off on kids or blaming kids, but, you know, at the same time, there are protocols, there are codes of conduct on both sides, there are, you know, and it sounds like the kids were totally following a, a code of conduct. I mean, we all hopefully ride the bus, and we know there's all kinds of conduct on the bus that happens. So, you know, it's not just kids. People get excited and, you know, exuberant. Exuberance is not a crime. And usually they don't let adults on those buses. I think it's just the driver. Um, I don't know. I think that I have a quick question. Um, uh, you know, my personal reaction is that GMT needs to require all drivers to have a training, you know, like racial bias training. Um, but then it, it makes me wonder, like, does the school district have that requirement um, of all the teachers and all the administration and then do they have that requirement for everybody who then also works with the kids because it's kind of like is, is that part of what the SD so okay so then why wouldn't that I, aside from it not I'm sorry my name's Hillary Martin um, I guess it's just like if it's not a contract why does that mean that if kids that are in the district are relying on that on GMT for transportation, then why wouldn't that be kind of advocated for by the district? Oh, Even though I, I hear what you're saying, like there's not a contract, so you right. kind of can't like ask for certain things from GMT or require them, but 
I mean, if GMT is shuttling kids to school and we're working with no, them. No, we could totally advocate for it. I'm just saying we can't, we don't have any leverage. Leverage, it's not like sure. We have a <coughs> MOU with the police. Like that is a document, an agreement, where we can say, these are our expectations, these are outcomes we want to see, and we should probably include Im implicit bias training in that MOU, because I don't think we have it. But we don't have anything, like, we don't have a formal arrangement with the I'm sorry. Anybody? Yeah. So, so we could totally advocate it, it, advocate for it, and we will. It's, I, I guess, you know, I, I mean, I think in, in situations like this, we all want to come to uh, <coughs> you know, the entity in charge and say, please change things. And, mm -hmm. and what I'm saying is, we can try and do our part. This is a very weird situation be that most people don't understand because it's just a federally regulated arrangement and we're not allowed to like pay for a school bus on public transit. So, we, so the city buys the service. So there's no like leverage. That doesn't mean that the administration, so Tom Chittenden is here, he's the chair of their board doesn't mean they're not working on it, they're not trying it. He, before people came in, already spoke, said they hear us, they're working on it. You know, we all know when we hear they're working on it, what that means, and it means we all have to work twice as hard, three times as hard, four times as hard, we, it, it's relentless, right? And so I think what I'm saying is, you know, I think in this committee you're gonna find people who are all on the <coughs> same page. And we will do what we can, and when we hear you, and we will bring that back to the administration. Our communications director said, you know, we're, we're looking for suggestions. We're looking for what to do. We're looking for how to prepare families. We're looking for that. And so, you know, there is an openness here. There's just not the ability to say, you know, we screwed up and we'll change things, because we didn't screw up and we'll change things. It's like our society screws up and our society needs to change things. GMT, you know, bus drivers screwed up, and so there's a process there. Um, so I'm sorry to say that on camera, but. <laughs> I just want to echo what you said earlier to your point. Uh, you do have leverage. The city of Burlington, not the school district, pays your largest municipal members, so you pay a large amount every year. If you really wanted to, you could exit the municipality. Please don't do that. We will, we will get better. We will work on this. Or we, uh, so you so have leverage, but just not as much for the school board. More we in the could city. buy public, I mean, private school service, and it would be a million, you know, it would be a million point <coughs> six dollars a year out of some other program. And Chapin Spencer, one of your two uh, reps on the board, is fully aware of this. We've been talking all day. Um, he is committed to a full investigation, so am I. And also on, I, I really like the sensitivity uh, training, uh, also de-escalation procedures. I have a six-year-old, I have a nine-year-old, she's here with me. I would never want any kid thrown off any bus anywhere in Vermont. So we, we need to work on that, and that should just be our first policy. So this is our top priority. I know time is short and we're wrapping up the, this session, um, but I did want to say one more thing. Um, we're talking a lot about the procedures, like how, how to continue procedurally, um, and I, I just want to remind and highlight that the lives of these children were affected this week in a way that can't be changed. It can never be erased. You know, these children have experienced what they feel strongly, and I also feel as a racist incident, that changes their worldview, you know? And they need to know that their community supports them. They need to know that we do not support any procedures, any adults, that, that racist discrimination is not supposed to be part of their lives as children or as adults. Um, so I don't have an answer right now for a lot of people have been asking me like, well, well how do we show support to the children? How do we um, you know, tell them that we care? I don't have an answer for that. I can say that one of my own children said, Amma, why are you trying so hard to, to make people listen? Nobody cares if it's not their own kid. So I appreciate everyone taking time out of their days and, um, and I appreciate everyone who's here for their time to do whatever they can to communicate to these children that actually we do care. We care very much. Yeah, thank you for that. And we can, as board members, we can definitely do that. We can communicate with our families.
And will you leave your comments? Will you I can or leave send them? Yeah, or I can, yeah. you can have this copy if you Thank want. Thank you. Yeah, Mark. <coughs> Good evening. Thanks, <coughs> thanks for having us out uh, and taking the time off of the, the schedule to, to listen to us. I, I'm deeply concerned. Uh, I just I just found out about this a couple hours ago, um, quite frankly, and, and I was over. Some of you saw me at the police commission meeting that didn't happen tonight, um, and I just got off the phone with Brandon as well <coughs> uh, because I think that there could have been some criminal uh, activity that happened here. Um, and uh, I didn't come with a pitchfork, but I, I just think that there's a, you know, there are a lot of different levels to what we're talking about here. I think that, you know, I, I don't want to create a uh, situation that uh, seemingly deals with this thing in a, in a uh, vacuum because we've got some big problems uh, here uh, in uh, Burlington. Uh, they're manifesting themselves in various ways. 17 kids were walking uh, down to the age of five. It's a shame. Isaiah Longmore was on that bus as well, along with 16 other kids. as Christine's grandson. Uh, so there's, so so now it kind of hit home. I just got off the phone with the Human Rights Commission Executive Director as well, and we're having those conversations too. Um, so this is serious. Uh, at the end of the day, Liz, uh, I personally I care deeply for you. Okay. Uh, so, but let's not get it confused. Uh, at the end of the day, the school is responsible. Because when parents put their kids on a bus in the morning to go to school, they expect them to get off the bus when they come home from school, period. Okay, I don't care about the relationship that you have with the city or what the city has with, at the end of the day, HRC, the Civil Rights Commission, they're going to be pointing at you. And we're going to be pointing at you, okay? So I'm not trying to put you on the spot personally, but at the end of the day, uh, when we fix this, as we fix this, there needs to be some culpability invol involving the school's responsibility. Whatever standards that you require, that we require in our schools, for everybody who comes in contact with our children, inherently extends to anybody else who contacts our, who is in contact with our children throughout the entire day until they get off the bus. Okay? So that's how we should be dealing with this. And any other way of dealing with this, I think, is short-sighted and it's irresponsible. So it's an adult who endangered the safety of children. That is a criminal charge. It really actually is. And if it was a black bus driver dropping kids off up on Spear Street, we'd be having a totally different conversation. That's really all I have to say. It's, it's horrendous. It's not that complicated. It's horrendous. That's it. Some, something needs to be done. You'll definitely see me again. Okay, I don't want to, I mean, I'm happy to talk to you guys further. I don't want to. Yeah, I've said everything I need to say. I just want to continue. Yeah. Thank, thank you for coming, everyone. And thanks for, um, you know, come back next thank month. You. Um, if you'd like, and we can continue the conversation. I don't know if we'll have information for you, but we can keep it on the agenda. Um, so, what please. It's the um, typically the third Tuesday of every month, um, and hopefully we oh fourth. Thank you, fourth. Fourth, fourth Tuesday. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's for this subcommittee. Yes. Will you name the subcommittee, please? Yeah. 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 subcommittee, please? Yeah. Diversity, equity, and inclusion okay. subcommittee. And the full school board meeting, the next one is on June 11th, is that correct? I thought we just we had noticed today that that one's not happening, so it's okay. June 18th. We are having one on the 4th, okay. and then one on the 18th. Those are the full school board meetings? Yes. And where will those take place? Typically they're at Bulletin High School, but they do move around, so you have to check the warning, the agenda warning. How do you find that on the internet? Go on your website. Um, ESD. ESD. It's ESD a bunch of on the steps. Website, but so you go to the website, you go to school board, the drop down menu says agenda, and you click on agenda, and then it takes you to this weird site called Board Docs. Okay. I could just send you the link to Board Docs. Okay. I think that probably the public wants to know yeah. as well. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for hearing us. Thank you.